we are now seven years old as a church, and, and I remember seven Christmases ago as we gathered in an auditorium at Britannia High School just off Commercial Drive, and uh, you know, this week I was at a basketball tournament in that same gym, and uh, as I walked into the school, I, I had a lot of nostalgic memories, mostly great, but some mixed, you know what I'm saying? It was great, and uh, we were there in those early days, and part of being there meant packing in all of our gear up a set of stairs because we did, weren't allowed to have access to the elevator, which was awesome. And, uh, you know, part of, of those early days meant that on week five, someone came through the school and thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to pull the fire alarm? And so our, our service on week five was in the parking lot, but we still had to pay for the building, which was awesome. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great memories. There were people who came to faith in that room. And in those early days, as we started as a church, our first Christmas, we said, we are going to take a, a significant offering for legacy. We're going to give it away. We're going to make the, the intended plan to be the type of people who aren't just here because of generosity, but who are here for the purpose of generosity. We're going to give, and we're going to bless others in a place that is not this place for a purpose that's not just this purpose. Of course, every week when we gather, we receive tithes and offerings because we are Bible people, and the Bible teaches us to put God first in our finance. But our legacy offering, what we're going to take part in today, is something above and beyond that. It's going to make a difference in other places and uh, really have a significant difference. If, if you are uh, here for the first time or maybe the first time in a while, uh, you wouldn't know this, but over the last month we've been talking about the, the, the gifts that are present in the church, being people who are gifted by God, each one as he decided to impart gifts and faith and that we're on a mission to be a gift to the world. We've been talking about this legacy offering and some of the things we're going to do together as a church. One of those things is we're working in partnership with Compassion Canada to uh, initiate two pregnancy relief centers, one in Ecuador and one in the Philippines, where pregnant moms who are in poverty are going to have uh, a group of people walk with them through prenatal, through uh, labor and delivery through the first year of life, all the medical expenses, all of the social uh, needs that take place as they walk through that process of life. We're going to do that. We may never meet the babies whose lives are going to be changed by it, but we're a church of generosity and we do things for the purpose of legacy. This is about being generous outside of these four walls. We've been talking uh, over the last four weeks, kind of for the first time publicly, that we're believing there'll come a day where we're going to own property here in Vancouver. We're going to own a building. It's not the city's responsibility to think about keeping God at the center of a growing city. It's the church's responsibility. And so as the city continues to grow and people come here and make this place home, we want to be a light that shines in a dark place and, and be the type of, of church that has established roots for our kids and our kids' kids. You know, you, you noticed as you walked in today, we are above a bakery, and our kids are meeting in small little side rooms, and we're in a tight little environment where the only way we can grow is adding more services, and we're all excited about things like this brand new curtain. I'm actually very excited about this curtain, but, uh, you know, that's a really simple change. We're expecting that there'll come a day where we're going to have space. For us, well, maybe, but for our kids and our kids' kids, we want to have permanence here in the city of Vancouver. We've been talking over these last four weeks about the ways we want to be able to extravagantly bless other churches as they're in the early days, as they're in the grind of planting and starting up a new church that we could come alongside and help in those early days in a more extravagant way than simply saying, we're praying for you. We want to be able to come alongside and say, we're going to take care of these expenses. Will it affect us personally? Well, not really, but we are people of generosity. We're giving in an extravagant way. Way We will continue, as our values have uh, stated, as one of the culture statements of our church is that we're a church that never stops starting. We're going to continue to send out people to start new locations throughout our region, and that all has a cost, and we're going to be the people who fund that. Why? Because we're generous people. That's what this Sunday is all about. It's legacy Sunday. And so I don't want to twist your arm today. I don't want to tell emotional stories today that maybe compel you or, or force you into a corner where you feel like giving. Instead, as I've been talking for four weeks, we're going to pray a bold prayer across our church. God, what would you have me give? And then as he speaks to us, we're going to be bold enough and courageous enough to obey. I've been talking about it for weeks so that we can have some preparation ahead of time. But before we uh, receive an offering, I want to make a case from Scripture about the generosity 
of God. If you're taking notes today, the title of today's message very simply is, It's Giving. It's giving. It means different things for different generations. It's just kind of a a statement to those that are my age and older. But to a younger person, it means something different. I hear from time to time, uh, you know, one of my daughters will come up from their bedroom ready for school, and their sister will look at them and say, oh, it's giving classy. I'm like, who's giving what the now? What's classy and what are we giving? They're like, Dad, you're so old. You're giving old. I'm like, that is, that's true. It's giving. It's one thing is is being presented, but is representing something else. I can see the effort that you're making, and the effort that you're making has an indication of something else. It's giving baller. Today, as we we talk about giving, I just want to say, like, a legacy offering is, is giving, it's giving generosity. It's giving the, the type of generosity that I believe God has in showing us his kindness. In fact, this Christmas season, it's not just about tinsel and toys, of course. It's not just about nostalgia and thinking back to where we were at at this point in our life, of course. Not about Christmas movies and gingerbread houses, of course. All those things are fine. Not about feasting. It's not even really about family, although we have back, you know, piggybacked all of those purposes onto this great day. The purpose and the meaning of Christmas, I think most profoundly, is God expressing his generosity to humanity in the person of Jesus. If you have your Bible with you, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 6, the prophet Isaiah speaking of the future purpose of God, way before it would take place, it is promising this to us as people. It says this, for to us, a child is born. And to us, a son is given. Can someone say given? Jesus is a gift of God. Jesus is God's gift to humanity. And you might be sitting there today saying, I, I didn't ask for a baby this Christmas. I want a waffle iron, I want a snowboard, I want, a, I want a, you know, a gift card to go get a facial. I want something different. But, but this gift given of a baby, this gift given to you and I, to us, this baby, is giving something different. It's not just a baby for baby's sake. Jesus was not just a, a, a person in keeping with every other person who had ever been born. This baby's unique because this baby carries the government on his shoulders. Have you ever felt like the weight of the world is on your shoulders? Your feelings are lying to you. The weight of the world is on Jesus' shoulders. He's carrying the weight. He's carrying the burden. I mean, feelings are a good thing to be in touch with, but not always to be believed. If you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, your feelings are telling you a lie. The government's on his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. So this baby, Jesus is giving a few different things. In the Psalms, in Psalm 62, David is writing and he says this, one thing God has spoken, but two things I've heard. I I love that. It's like a person you love, there is a subtext dialogue that's taking place, right? Sometimes just with eyes or body language. I can look across the room at one of my kids or at my wife or someone who I'm in close relationship with and with one look, oh, I know what you mean. One thing you said, but two things you meant. You know what I'm talking about? This, this is what it means. Like God, in sending Jesus, he's like, it's a baby. And someone's like, cool. I wanted a baby. Someone in the room, you're like, I don't want any more babies. Or it's not in this season of my life that I would want a baby. And God's like, no, 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 no. This baby is giving something different. Because this baby will be named Wonderful Counselor. When, when God gave Jesus his son, With Jesus came wonderful counsel. Not just pity. Have you ever tried to pour your heart to someone and the end result, like, wow, that's really sad? You're like, well, I kind of was hoping for a little more than just that. No, Jesus brings wonderful counsel. He doesn't just bring pity, he brings a solution to the problem. Jesus didn't just come so we know God feels bad for us. He came to be the light of the world. 
He didn't just come so he could say, like, man, I know being a person's tough. I did not anticipate that when I created the world. I didn't think of how hard it would be to be a human. So I'm just coming to feel bad for you. He came to bring wonderful counsel that all the wisdom and perspective of God could be accessible to us because this baby is giving wisdom. He would not only be called wonderful counsel, he would be called mighty God. Now, babies are a lot of things. Mighty is not one of them. You get around someone who's got a baby, and for some reason, you're like, oh, I just want to eat their toes. It's weird that we go straight to the toes. I just think it's a little strange. It's like all the cuteness and all the, oh, the, oh, the smell. I've never once heard someone say, wow, what a mighty baby this is. It's just not one of the words we associate with infancy. But this baby is giving might. This, this gift that God gave of Jesus brings power, mighty God. All the power that is God's was shared with us when Jesus came. He sent his son Jesus so we would not be powerless in this world. That we wouldn't have to be intimidated by things like sin or death because we have the power of a mighty God. Not only is he powerful, he is the everlasting father. Again, the generations are getting sort of mixed. I'm going to send you the son so that you can experience the father. I'm not just sending you a job to do in taking care of the baby. I'm sending you fatherhood. What does fatherhood represent? Identity, culture, provision, protection. This baby is giving fatherhood. Identity, protection, provision. That's why Philip, the friend of Jesus, he's like, hey, God, if, Jesus, if you could just show us the Father, then we could know what he's like. And Jesus says, oh, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When we, when we meet Jesus, we see what God's like. We see all the compassion that Jesus has. That's always been the heart of God towards humanity. All of the justice that Jesus stands for has always been the heart of God. Man, all, all of the the calmness that Jesus brings came from the Father. All, all of the perspective that shifts the way we were, we were maybe taught to think, it came from the Father because this baby that Isaiah is talking about generations and generations and generations before he would be born, he was a gift to us, bringing the perspective of God, bringing the, the power of God, bringing the provision of God, and then lastly, he says he'll also be called the Prince of Peace. God wants to share his peace with us. What a gift. Babies are a lot of things. Peaceful is maybe not one of them. At least not all the 24 hours of a day. They're peaceful sometimes. But this baby's unique because this baby is, is giving peace. You get around Jesus and, and peace begins to emanate in your life. You get around Jesus, and all of a sudden, some of the worries that seem so pervasive, you're like, oh, I got this. It's a peace that passes understanding. I can't even tell you why. It just is. An indescribable gift of peace. God's generous. And this, this gift that he was talking about in, in advance came to be in the book of Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 2. It's the Christmas narrative, the Christmas story, where Mary and Joseph have been preparing for a baby that would be born. Strange circumstances around this baby. A baby born to a virgin. Mary and Joseph had a few awkward conversations with each other. They had a few awkward conversations with their parents. It's like Mary had to tell her parents, but Joseph had to tell his. I often, I often just kind of feel for Joseph in the Christmas story. What do we know Joseph's job was? Yeah, it's like Bible trivia in here. What was he? So you got Joseph. He's like, okay, I'm not even like biologically the father, but I'm committed to Mary. And <sighs> what can I actually do? How many dads in the room? Just wave at me if you're a dad. You know you hit, reach that time where you're like, hey, babe, you got this. Like there's literally nothing I can really do right now. I can guess what food you might be craving, but I think that's kind of it. Joseph's like, the only thing I can actually kind of do I'm going to make the best nursery any baby has ever seen. I'm going to build a cradle like no one's ever seen. And then came the announcement, you can't even be at home for the birth of this baby because you got to go make a census somewhere and mark on a page that your ancestors were born in this city. Super awkward and inconvenient timing 
for poor Mary and Joseph. I saw a meme recently saying that the, the origin of the song Silent Night came in this, that Joseph forgot to make a hotel reservation. He's like, Mary, I'm sorry. I should have made the reservation. She's like, I don't want to talk to you right now. And that was the beginning of Silent Night. There was no room for them in an inn. Nobody had made a plan. No one had prepared except for God. He'd been thinking about it for generations. He'd been thinking about it before the foundation of the earth was laid. He's like, I'm going to show my kindness to humanity. I'm so generous. I overflow with generosity. I'm making a perfect plan. Have you ever felt like your life is not going perfectly? Well, the promise of Jesus is this indication that God is working all things together for good. Like Mary and Joseph must have been like, everything that could go wrong. Like, like we read the baby books, what to expect when you're expecting. Senses from the Caesar were not in the book. Awkward conversations about virginity and birth were not in the book. It's not going the way we planned, but God had a perfect plan. He sent Jesus, born in a manger, in a stable. Historically, geographically, it was probably a cave just somewhere on the side of a hillside. Nobody's birth plan includes manure. Sitting with your doula. So what do you want the, the birth to be like? I'm picturing sheep, manure, maybe a couple donkeys, you know. Hey, that's nice and itchy. Let's include some of that. And into this environment, Jesus was born. I think it's a promise to you and I that God doesn't need neat, clean, tidy people to bring a promise to. He doesn't need us to have it all buttoned down and perfectly presented. He comes to us in the grit of where we're at. And on that night, the baby was born, promising to be the one who would bring wonderful counsel, all the might of God, his everlasting power and fatherhood. He's the prince of peace. And then an angel came to a shepherd, busy doing something menial and insignificant, because God is reminding us through the Christmas narrative that he uses his average Joes. What's the archetype of the person God will use? Ah, just people like us. And he speaks to this, this shepherd, an angel bringing a promise and he says this promise, and it echoes through the ages. Look at the promise to the, the shepherd. Do not be afraid, for I bring good news that will cause great joy for all people. The good news of Jesus still causes great joy for you and I because God in his gift of Jesus was giving his perspective and his power and his provision in his peace. Good news, great joy, all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. Check this, to you. A gift to you and I. And he'll be the Messiah. He's Christ the Lord. And it'll be a sign to you. You're going to find this baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a what? A manger. I love the accessibility of God. He wants to be known. He wants to be found. He wants to be discovered. He doesn't say, man, like there, there's, there's a little clue for you. It's like an elaborate escape room. You're going to have to figure out how to find God. He's like, no, no, just look in barns till you find someone dumb enough to have their baby lying in a manger, and then you will know that is the promise of God that Isaiah talked about. In a desperate, broken, dirty situation, I'm bringing peace to earth. And then the sky fills with angels, and they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. The, the story of Christmas is giving generosity. The story of Christmas is not festivity. It's not nostalgia. It's giving generosity. God is an elaborate, extravagant, generous God. And I want to show you in, in Scripture that this is not just cherry-picking. It's not just finding one reference to try to, you know, curtail into a, a moment of extravagant giving on our part. God is generous. If you're taking notes, write this down. God is generous to us. God's generosity is to us. Let me show you in Scripture. In Psalm 31, 19, I'm going to show you a lot of Scripture today. Get ready. In Psalm 31, 19, it says this of God. How abundant are the good things 
that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all. Do you have that person in your life who's so generous, they don't even know who the gift's for or when it's gonna be used, but like, ooh, that's a good deal. I'm gonna grab that now because there will come a time where someone needs that cute little scarf. You got that auntie? You got that uncle? Are you that auntie? Are you that uncle, that person who's always thinking ahead? Ooh, they're gonna love this. God is storing up an abundance of good things for you and I. When we put our trust in him, God's like, oh, let me go to my little uh, treasure chest here. I've been storing up good things for you, and I want you to experience them. Don't you think that's kind of cool? That when we come to God with a need, he's not like, ooh, kind of shocked me with that one. You caught me off guard. It's just kind of a tough month. Been solving a lot of other problems. Can you come back to me on that? No, he's been storing it up and saving up good things for you and I to experience. How do we access these things? Look what Matthew chapter 7 says. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks you for a, a, a piece of bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who Ask him. God is so generous that he's not bothered by asking. When we ask him, God is not put out. God is not inconvenienced. God doesn't reach his max. He doesn't reach his quota. It is his heart to give because he is generous to us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says this, that without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God has so much goodness stored up for you and I that when you ask, you receive. That when you seek, he goes, watch, watch, just watch. Check this out. God gets excited about giving us gifts. Have you ever felt that feeling when you just nail it? You know I bought the perfect gift. Whenever I buy things for my wife, I, I love getting to the counter. And they're always like, oh, poor guy. Do you want a gift receipt? I'm like, no. They're like, oh, it's not a gift? I'm like, it's a gift. I don't want a gift receipt. Like, why don't you want a gift receipt? I'm like, because I know I got the right thing. You know what I mean? That feeling, you're like, no, I'm, I nailed it. Trust me. I know the person that's receiving this gift more than you do. It's the right thing. Are you sure you got the right size? Oh, I got the right size. I know. This is God. He has been preparing to pour out good things into our life. So ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find those things. He will earnestly reward those who seek him. And what kind of things can we expect? Well, look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one and verse three. This is the type of expectation we can have about the goodness and the blessing of God. Ephesians chapter one in verse three. It says this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual Blessing. Every spiritual blessing. I'm here to tell you today, God does not just help us pay our bills. God does not just help, help with tangible things. He has every spiritual blessing in store for you and I when we ask him and when we seek, and he's been planning it for a long time. I, I think when we come to God with our need, he's like, I've been waiting for this moment. When we come with our request, he's like, oh, finally, the moment has arrived. And he shares with us every spiritual blessing, but don't get me wrong, the blessings he shares are not just spiritual. Check out Philippians chapter four, which says this, that my God will supply for all your needs according to his riches in glory. So we're not talking only spiritual, we're also talking tangible. How many of the needs? All of them. There is no need outside of the purview or the realm that you can bring to God. There's no such thing as a non-spiritual need. There's no such thing as like, well, I shouldn't bother God with this because it's kind of my issue. It's kind of my problem. It's kind of just my preference. No, you can bring all your needs to God, and he has been storing up good things to share with you in the sight of all. God wants to bless your life publicly. 
not just meet you in the quiet place, but change the way you live your life, to crown your life with love and compassion. Can someone say, God is generous to us? Come on, let's all say it. God is generous to us. Number two, if you're taking notes, God is generous for us. His generosity is not just to us, it's for us. It's not just that God is like, hey, I'm going to give this to you. It might not be what you want, but it's what you need, and you're just, you can just deal with it. He actually is generous on our behalf as well. It is for us to enjoy. Look what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you are not someone who memorizes scriptures, I think you should start today, and I think you should start with this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6 in verse 17, it's a promise you should probably have locked and loaded in your heart. It says this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but instead to put their hope in God, who richly provides for us with everything for our enjoyment. Everything for our enjoyment. Do you know when you enjoy life, God enjoys it? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. God enjoys it. He enjoys us enjoying life. Earlier this week, I was in San Francisco, and I was visiting my friend Vance, who started a tech company called Overflow, an app that helps people express generosity across the world. They're doing amazing things, and he said, I want to throw a party because we're starting a new foundation where we want to give away the money that our business is making because we're not just generous as an end goal. We're generous so we can be generous. And so he said, I want to start with a party. And so he invited some of his friends, and we found ourselves in, in a room celebrating together. And you know how we celebrated? Some of the best food I have ever eaten. I love fasting and prayer, but I love feasting and prayer. And there was something spiritual taking place around the table as we were eating food and enjoying flavors and enjoying company and telling stories and laughing and making memories. What was happening? We were experiencing the goodness of God for our enjoyment. Sometimes we, we think of ourselves as more holy than God's asking us to be. Oh, no, no. It's not about enjoyment. I'm a Christian. We don't smile. No, no, everything for our enjoyment. It is a pleasure to God when we experience the pleasures of life. And this is not just a New Testament idea. You can find it in the Old Testament as well. Look at, uh, at Psalms 84 and 11. Psalm 84 and 11. You can turn all the way back into the Old Testament. It says this, that the Lord is our strength and our shield, and he bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold. How many things does God withhold that are good? None. All of it. It's all for our enjoyment, and he doesn't withhold any good thing. Man, sometimes people think, I don't want to know what God's plan is for my life because he's probably trying to ruin it. If I was God, that's what I would do after all, try to spoil fun. No, 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 no. God has created everything for our enjoyment. His generosity is for us. He's not like, now you're just going to sit down and you're going to receive this blessing, and I don't care what you think about it. He's like, no, no, enjoy life. Enjoy life. The season you're in, I always tell people, whatever season you're in, your only job really is enjoy it. But this is not according to the plan I had. Do you think it was Mary or Joseph's perfect plan? Enjoy the season you're in. Enjoy what you are walking through right now because God will meet you where you're at and bring blessing into this situation. Look what Romans 8.32 says. For if God did not spare his own son for us all, how will he not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? So I want to tell you that the generosity of God is not just to us, it's for us. He wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to experience good things. He doesn't want us to, to think of ourselves as too holy for happiness. Man, there's something holy about being happy. I, I, I got a little bit of a theological problem with Christians who can never choose happiness you know, it's just there's so much hurting in the world. Yeah, but God is here, and he's amongst us, and he's for us, and he's using us to be a light into this world. And one of the greatest expressions of testimony that we trust God is that we can enjoy life. We can enjoy the seasons that we're in. Look at this. James chapter 117 says this. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. 
from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So every good thing comes from God? Yeah. All truth is God's truth. Man, science, whoo, it gets me excited about God. Music makes me more appreciative of God. I love art because it reminds me of God and tastes and flavors and experiences and cultures and travel and rest and family and warmth and, 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 and ice baths and whatever. Man, it all is a gift from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. God's generosity is to us. God's generosity is for us. Number three, if you're taking notes, God is generous through us. Through us. We're his body. He's the head. Earlier this week, I met a a couple who's planted a church in Hickory, North Carolina. And their church called Soma Church. It's the, the Greek word for the body. They said from day one, we just want to be reminded that we're part of something bigger, but Jesus is the head. He's in charge. And everything we do is following his leadership. It reminded me of the series we've been in for a month, just talking about being equipped and finding our fit and finding our gifts so we can be a part of the purpose and the mission of God. The generosity of God is not just to us and then stopping there. It's not just for us, for enjoyment's sake alone. God is generous through us. Man, think of this. Jesus, who is the head, he, he, he lived 33 years on earth. But then he filled us with us, his spirit and said, now go into the, all the world. Jesus occupied one time in space. He, he, the, the gospel moved at the speed uh, of walking. But then he said this, now go everywhere. His generosity that came to us at Christmas is that there would be peace on earth, goodwill towards all mankind. That's why when the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, they told everybody. Because the the message of generosity is not just for us. It's that God could work through us as well. I want to look at one more scripture today. If we could go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I've heard of this uh, referred to as Second Generosity Chapter 9 because the book of Corinthians really has a lot to say about generosity. As we look at our legacy offering, there's a lot to say about our, our generosity. The church in Corinth was probably like us in many ways. People who hadn't earned or deserved salvation just like us. Pe- people who, who were called out of all sorts of unique brokenness just like us. People who were surprised to find themselves recipients of the goodness of God, just like us. People who were well-intended, I'd like to say, just like us. And and, and because of their good intentions, Paul wrote them a letter. He said, I know you were actually the first to have a desire to give. You might not have known that, but I did. You were the first ones. I've been talking about God and his purpose and church planting and, and spreading the gospel all over, but you were the first ones who wanted to give to that. And so I'm writing you a letter ahead of time. So when I show up, We can just get that thing sorted. I want to logistically make a good plan so that you don't just have good intentions with no follow through. Anybody ever intend to do something and never get to it? Have you ever reached that point where you're like, well, now it's just too late. Was supposed to respond to the email, but it's been a month. I was supposed to, you know, do that thing, but enough time has passed. It's just a little bit too late. Paul goes, I don't want you to feel that awkward. And so I'm just going to let you know, I'm coming soon. When I come, we're going to actually do the giving part that we talked about. That's why for four weeks I've been saying, hey, let's pray this bold prayer. God, what would you have me give? So that we can actually follow through. A lot, a lot of the greatest intended moments miss out on ever receiving blessing because we don't do anything with them. We had great intentions to become a better husband or to be a better mom or we had great intentions to start a philanthropic arm of our business or great intentions to develop our gift or great intentions to be more disciplined or great intentions to get in shape or invest for our future. But if we don't follow through, we never experience the blessing. You have the greatest intentions about overcoming addiction or the greatest intentions about making a new friend, but unless you take some steps, right? You follow with me? So Paul goes, I just want us to get ready so we can actually follow through. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Remember this, 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will reap generously. Then he says this, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me give you a description of what I think this feels like. Once upon a time, when you went to a restaurant, you received service. And the service when it was good, was responded to with a tip. At least that's how I was raised. Remember my parents sitting me down and say, hey, we're, we're tipping people. It's a good way to learn generosity. That you can respond to, to service by saying to someone, hey, I noticed you. Well, times have changed, guys. Tips have nothing to do with service. Tips have nothing to do with generosity. Now they just flip and they go, hey, the screen is going to ask you a question right now, as if they don't know what the question is, right? And then the question is just buttons all over. Would you like to give lots, more, even more, or be a jerk? Your choice. And then after turning the screen, they kind of look away as if they're like, as if they won't know what happened, because then they turn the screen back and go, oh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, if you want... If you want to go into the back end of this app and, like, do some coding, you can find a spot that says, no, thank you. I have a friend who recently was at a restaurant. He's like, tell me the story. He's like, I've never done this before. But the service was so bad. They got our order wrong. They forgot to bring one of the items. The food that came was cold. The the glasses they put our water in were dirty. People who sat later than us got their food before us. It it was bad. The server was rude. And he said, I've never done this before, but as we left, I'm like, I just can't give a tip. I I could help them figure out their processes, but I can't give them a tip. And so as they were walking out to the parking lot, the hostess came running out and said, these people are the type of people who don't give tips. They don't care about the working class. And she tore a strip off them and brought the, the, the uh, point of sale back on. Like, you better give a tip. It is an expectation. Now, look, I'm still a tipper because I'm not going to let shifting of society change what I'm like. But I have to make a choice Now, when the screen is turned, like, I'm not doing this because the screen told me to. I'm doing this because of a principle that I want to act in. And this is what Paul says. He goes, look, I'm not going to ask you an awkward question like, has God been good to you or really good to you? Hmm? I guess we'll find out what you think about God. He goes, just you do what your heart finds to do. Don't give reluctantly, but also don't give out of compulsion what God wants is that moment in time where you give, you know what I used to love? Giving with cash. And then you could say, keep the change. Oh, there's just something so good about that moment of joy. We've got to find that moment of joy when we give to the Lord. It's not compulsion. It's not because God needs it. It's not because God's like, guys, the world has gone way crazier than I thought. All these wars and rumors of wars, they're stressing me out. You know, I was going to come earlier, but now I might come later. I don't know. It, it, we give so that we can experience the fullness of what God is like. When we give, we're experiencing his nature within us, doing something. We're, we're actually being like Jesus and following his leadership in our lives. When we give generously, look what it says. Don't give under compulsion. Don't give reluctantly. And then here's some promises. It says this, because God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times and having all you need, you may abound in every good work. All, 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 every. God is really trying to prove a point. Why can we give with joy? Well, it's the right thing to do. No, we can give with joy because God's like, just watch. I care so much about generosity and positioning you to be generous that when you give, Oh, I'll make sure that you have all you need. I'll make sure that you experience an increase. Look at this. It says, as it is written, you have freely scattered seeds of gifts to the poor, and the righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food 
will also supply and increase. Can someone say increase? Come on, can someone say increase? God doesn't just supply for your needs. He doesn't just say, well, okay, so you gave a, a tenner. Okay, I'll give you 10 back, but you're going to have to work for it. No, he's like, no, no, I'm going to increase your capacity. You've been trusted with little. You've been generous with little. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to increase your, your capacity. He increases the store of seed. He will enlarge. Can someone say enlarge? Enlarge the harvest of righteousness in your life. You will be enriched. Can someone say enrich? Enrich you in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This to me is pretty cool. When we're generous, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And it says this of, of the thanksgiving that goes to God. It says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it overflows in expressions of thanks to God. There's going to be a mom in Ecuador who's unexpectedly pregnant and can't afford it, who's super stressed. And in desperation, she's going to pray to God, God, I need your help. And then because of gifts given in a Vancouver warehouse, a local church is going to come alongside and say, ma'am, we've got your back. And she will not say, can I get the name and address of the people in Vancouver to thank them for this? Because she won't know we exist. Instead, she's going to thank God. God will thank us by increasing and enriching us. He promises he will. God will actually express the overflow of his generosity by making sure our needs are cared for and we increase. But then on the flip side, people are just saying, oh God, you, you heard my prayer. I think of this like some years from now, there'll be people who move to Vancouver. They pay way more for their tiny little condo than they expected. They're here to see their dreams come true. They're going to reach a point where they're so lonely. Like, Man, I just need community. I'm so alone. And they're going to be walking by a building that somehow we were able to purchase. And they're going to walk in and find, oh, my goodness, there's a place for my kids here. Oh, wow, there's people like me here. I, mean, I found my family. Oh, man, they, got, they have a program to help me with my secret addictions. This is crazy. They have a place for me to express my gift? Are you serious? They won't know a place like that existed. And when it does, they won't say, okay, well, when did the building fund start? I got to go thank those people. They'll just say, thank you, God, that you heard my prayer. God is going to thank us. God is going to bless us and pour and increase and enrich us, but they're going to thank God. This is why Paul says this, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. When we engage in generosity, it's just an indescribable gift where the sum of the parts is just greater. You're like, hold on. So someone's gonna be blessed, yeah. And God's gonna bless me, yeah. And then they'll bless God, yes. That's an indescribable gift. When nobody is at the cost end of it, we're all at the receiving end of it. God wants to enrich our lives, to care for us. And, and, and far too often, I think, for fear of being manipulative, we back away. We're like, I just don't know. I don't want to give to get. And God's like, this is actually part of why I want you to give, because I want you to experience how generous I am. Like, trust me in this. Just watch what I'm going to do. God wants to bless our lives. And he wants to be a blessing through our lives.